as you may well know, for many, many years, Christadelphians have been giving lectures, Bible classes, we've published books and pamphlets on the great crisis of Ezekiel chapter 38, on the apocalyptic Armageddon, uh, all of which concern the controversy of Zion. Here are a few examples. Anatolia, I suppose, is one of the very early ones. That's now known as Exposition of Daniel by Brother John Thomas. England and Egypt, prophecy fulfilled and fulfilling. Robert Roberts wrote about that. The events of 1916 in the light of prophecy. Uh, various talks have been given. Is war with Russia inevitable? Many of you perhaps remember that pamphlet. And Russia, the Vatican, and the invasion of Israel, all coming from uh, Christadelphian works over many, many years. We've talked and written about Russia coming down into the Middle East, brothers and sisters. We've heard how that Nebuchadnezzar's image has to be built up and then smitten by the stone power. We have held many talks about the return of the Jew to the land over the years and about the return of Christ to subdue the nations and establish the kingdom. But what is it that triggers this event? What are the forces at work which will bring the controversy of Zion to a head? Well, the scriptures reveal that there are really two opposing elements that will lead to this crisis. First of all, uh, well, we, we, we often spend time identifying Rosh and Magog and Gomer, but the scripture shows us, though, that there are two main features. First of all, that there would be a development of human philosophy. That is, the mind of the flesh manifested in both politics and religion. Secondly, that there would be the restoration of the Jews to their ancient land and the development of religious, and I mean biblical, Zionism and a secular Zionism that we're familiar with. And it's these two ideological opposites that have been and which will put the world on a collision course, uh, leading it to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, as we read of it in Revelation chapter 16. We have two forms of wisdom at work, brothers and sisters, don't we? There is the wisdom of God, as we see it outlined on this side of our chart. And then there is the wisdom of this world, as it is outlined on that side of the chart. The wisdom of God is expressed in various ways throughout the scripture, and we've noted some of, the, uh, some of the expressions there that are used, the testimony of God, the spirit of the truth, and, and, and so on. And the wisdom of the world, likewise, it's expressed variously, the spirit of the world, the wisdom of men, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, the spirit of error, and so on, uh, all showing us the uh, various ways in which this is expressed. But first, what we want to do in this last talk is to look at the human wisdom, the, the development of what has happened from the human mind. As you know, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, we read there how that the carnal mind is enmity against God. Brothers and sisters, that is a very, very fundamental principle that we've always got to bear in mind. The carnal mind, or as the revised version puts it, the mind of the flesh. Carnal comes from the Greek sax, means, uh, amongst other things, it means human nature. Human nature is hostile towards God. That's the sense of it. Human thinking is opposed to God's thinking. And, of course, as we read our Bibles, we know that this has always been the case, don't we? Men designed the Tower of Babel, didn't they, in opposition to God. 
and the kingdom of Nimrod. Read about that in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. This brought about a society based upon human ambition. Let us make us a name. That's what the people of Babel said. Let us make us a name. It was a society, you see, based upon human values. And it developed, of course, the religion and the society that we know of as Babylon. Well, now, all that has its counterpart in the latter days, in the days in which we live. And we find that it is a movement that began uh, very soon after the Reformation in the 16th century. At that time, there were what we might call anti-Bible movements that began, and they championed human values, whilst at the same time rejecting uh, the authority of Scripture, rejecting the idea of God, and that gave birth to that philosophy that we know today uh, by the name of humanism. That was followed very quickly afterwards by textual criticism, uh, the theory of evolution, and so on. And all these things have contributed to bring about a godless society, such as we see around us today in uh, tremendous evidence to what it was when I lived in Great Britain sort of 25, 30 years ago. And so Romans chapter 1, I think, gives us the idea of what has taken place. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And that was the work of these philosophers, such as we see them here, Descartes, Spinoza, Voltaire, Rousseau, these humanist philosophies that, uh, philosophers that... Um, that uh, brought out their ideas at that particular time. And so we're left today with a very humanistic society. And this humanist uh, society expresses itself. Uh, for example, we turn to the uh, American um, Humanist Association. You can look it up on the, on the web or anything like that. You can find it out. Anybody can look it up. Uh, but it makes it quite clear that they are hostile to, as it says there, biblical fundamentalism. Just a couple of quotes from their work. They are especially opposed, it says, to, to those who fill the ranks of the religious right, who reject the theory of evolution and sex education, uh, situation ethics, as they call it, and so on. These are the enemies of humanists. Humanists reject arbitrary faith, authority, revelation. Humanism is a philosophy for the here and now, they say. So in the sign language of the book of Revelation, the spirit of our time, brothers and sisters, is described, as you may well know, in, um, in the language of Revelation chapter 16. And here we see it described the spirit of our time described as unclean spirits, uh, spirits of demons, uh, like frogs, it says, and so on. And, and it's this that Revelation 16 points out to us is what will ultimately gather the nations uh, to uh, Armageddon. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets, for they are the spirits of devils or demons, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, brothers and sisters, there may be things there that we want to look at a bit deeper, some, some of the difficult symbolic language, but one thing you can see quite clearly that these spirits are gathering the nations to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's where it is leading. And uh, we have brethren who have uh, uh, explained these things to us. And it's a form of wisdom which is described by the Apostle James, for example, here in, uh, in, in, in James chapter 3. 
If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, he says, glory not and lie not against the truth. Because this wisdom, this type of wisdom, if you can call it wisdom, he does, this wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. And the word is demoniacal. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. And that is what we are seeing in the world around us today, brothers and sisters. It's human thinking that has produced a society that is earthly, sensual, and as it has it here, demonic. They're sick in the head. That, what else can you say? That, that's, the, that's the idea of the society in which we live. And it brings about confusion. Well, of course it does. And, uh, and every evil work. Brother John Thomas wrote a little book and uh, published a little book. Uh, there it is on the screen, the screen, The Destiny of Human Governments. But he describes this spirit of Revelation 16 uh, in these words. <clears throat> after explaining some of the scriptures and going into the background and so on, he says, this power is antagonistic to all peace, law, and order. It is known among the nations by various names, such as socialist, communist, democracy, atheism, etc., etc. It is a monster but necessary evil in the world, he says. And so we have seen in various stages of history... Uh, this spirit of madness that has gripped the nations uh, politically. We saw it erupt, first of all, historically, in the French Revolution, didn't we? And in that terrible reign of terror. A spirit that claimed to give liberty and equality and fraternity actually brought about a reign of terror. And we live in a world of terror today, don't we? Terrorism. And it all comes from this same basic philosophy. And then, of course, we saw in the 1930s and the 1940s that same spirit of madness, but in a different guise, come out, in the, uh, out of the mouth of the Germanic beast, we might say, giving the world a taste of what was going to come. It was seen in the anti-Semitism of those times. Anti-Jewish is, is what it always has been. This was Nazi Germany. People outside the shops saying, don't buy from Jews. That's what the, that's what the notice uh, is telling us. Boycotts. And the boycotts, of course, were then followed by the vandalism and the violence against the Jewish people in Germany at that time. And wider than Germany, too, of course. Now, this same spirit today is being seen in an anti-Bible society that we are living in. And those of us who believe the Bible and, and, uh, and speak about it uh, will find ourselves not very popular as time goes on and as this develops. We live in a world that is more and more opposed to any form of Bible-based religion. You can base your religion on the Koran or Buddhism or this or that or whatever, but a Bible-based society, a religion, is, is what the world hates. Look at these headlines. Busy menace of fundamentalism. That's written by quite a well-known journalist in England, or at least he was anyway, Gerald Priestland, uh, that uh, wrote on uh, those things. Fundamentalist abuse of the Christian faith, says another article. And one could multiply these things, just showing us the world's attitude to anything that approaches uh, what they would call, uh, you know, bi Bible fundamentalism. And it's an anti-Bible atmosphere that's built up in the society in which we live today. And that anti-Bible sentiment is translating into an anti-Israel sentiment. And you're going to find more and more that the media will be opposed to that. Now, that's our latest issue of the Bible magazine. And if anybody doesn't have a copy or they would like to have a look at one, I'm going to plonk them right there. And you can help yourself for free.
there they are if you want to uh, if you haven't got it and if you don't get it and help yourself and and have a read as the old saying was read yourself rich <laughs> now it's the same pattern brethren and sisters that we saw in the 1930s and the 1940s that is emerging again today and really it's quite frightening I mean here's just a, sh a small selection of the sort of thing that we are seeing do not buy from Jews. That was the notice in Nazi uh, Germany. Look what's happening today. Boycott Israel, says. Uh, and these are, these are um, protest marches that were going on in Great Britain, in England. Uh, stop supporting the child killers. Boycott Israel, says another poster. Israel is a racist state. End the terror. The New Statesman comes out with an issue uh, talking about the kosher conspiracy. The old, uh, you know, um, protocols of the elders of Zion coming out in different forms. Once. This is what's happening in the world in which we live. We see an anti-Israel, anti-Zionist uh, propaganda being put out by the main media. And in England today, I don't mind telling you, I've switched off the BBC several years ago. I never listened to it now. At one time, as an expatriate, I always longed to listen to the BBC. We used to take a piece of copper wire out and string it in the garden and listen to the shortwave radio and all like that. Not anymore. I've had my fill of the BBC. It's a propaganda uh, outfit as far as I'm concerned. I just... I have nothing to do with them anymore. I take no information from them because it's all slanted. And if you read the Guardian newspaper, you'll find exactly the same thing coming out of that era. The Daily Mirror, I'm sure nobody here would possibly take the Daily Mirror, but if you, if you, if you did take the Daily Mirror, um, you'd find the same thing again. And not just there, the United Nations. Look at the United Nations and the resolutions that are coming out of the UN. Very favorable to Israel, aren't they? I don't think. You know, it, it, this, this is the anti-Bible society that is producing an anti-Zionist and anti-Israel uh, um, line. And that's what we're seeing coming out more and more. And what it is, brothers and sisters, you know, is that perpetual hatred that we read about in the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 35 and verse 5. And you might want to just uh, open your Bible and have a look at these verses in, in Ezekiel chapter 35. It's all about Edom or Mount Seir which is Edom. And when you look at that prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 35, you see, uh, you see here a main feature. And there it is in verse 5 where he says, Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Yes, that has been taken hold of by some would-be interpreters of prophecy. And they have said, well, Edom, of course, is the Arabs. And so, therefore, uh, what we're seeing here is the perpetual hatred of the Arabs. Brothers and sisters, it is much wider than that. Verse 12 and 13. Thou shalt know that I am the Lord and have and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel. Notice that expression, the mountains of Israel. It's the West Bank. Take your relief map out and have a look at it. It is the West Bank. Saying, they are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. And God says, thus with your mouth you have boasted against me. And have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Why against him? Well because of those promises. Because of those covenants that we talked about in our first uh, talk today. That's why. That's what God has said he will do. Those are the promises. And it's laid out who he will give them to. 
And these nations are coming and saying, well, they're given to us to take into possession. So Edom, then, we must understand, is a typical name. Now, many brethren have noted that as well. It isn't something new from me. Uh, Brother C.C. C. Walker was one, for example, in Ministry of the Prophets. Uh, also, this is how the Jews themselves understand that uh, chapter of, in Edom. Just look at this. This is taken from a Jewish website, and anybody who wants to look it up can do so. I will read it out to you, just in case you can't read it off the screen. Here is the, uh, whatever they call it, what you punch into your computer to look at it. www.betemunah, betemunah.org, slash Edom, dot HTML. You can get that information from me afterwards if you want. But this chart is what they have on that website. Now you all recognize what it is. It is it's, it's, uh, Daniel chapter 2, right? Daniel chapter 2, we recognize Babylon, Media, Greece, Rome. And they have put underneath Rome in brackets, they have put Edom. And this is what they say. On, on the, on, on the, um, on, on the uh, site. Thus we see that the Moshiach will come at the end of the Galut Edom. The present exile is seen as an extension of the Roman exile. Edom is Rome, they say. Since culturally and legally, Western civilization shares the values and world view of ancient Rome. A subset of this exile is that of Ishmael, the Arabs, who are seen as an antithesis to, of, of Roman civilization and values, and who will rule over the Jewish people for a time, concurrently with the exile of Rome. The exile of Ishmael and the exile of Edom are represented by the legs in the vision interpreted by Daniel. And it goes on to say, According to Jewish tradition, we are presently in the diaspora of Edom, the last of the four diasporas, the one immediately preceding the arrival of Moshiach. The Torah tells us that Esau is synonymous with Edom, and these are the descendants of Esau. He is Edom, Bereshit, chapter 38, verse 1. That's Genesis, chapter 38, verse 1. This diaspora is also known as the Roman diaspora. It began with the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans and the cultural, spiritual basis of the Western world. The broader venue of this entire diaspora was the Holy Roman Empire. The destruction of the Second Temple is also coincident with the birth and rise of Christianity. They mean Catholicism type Christianity, of course. The cornerstone of Western morality and ethics. Jewish tradition gives us the following formula. Esau equal Edom equal Rome equal Christianity. By which they mean apostate Christianity, of course. Right? That's not me, that's a Jewish website. Do they have any biblical support for that idea? Well, yes they do, brothers and sisters, but my talk isn't about Edom today. But Psalm 137, verses 7 and 8, you can look at it, and you can see there how that Babylon, the daughter of Babylon and Edom, are equated, and there are other passages also, such as the one that the Apostle Paul quotes uh, in Acts. But that be as it may, we can see how that this perpetual hatred, this anti-Semitism is, a, is a, um, a feature, a characteristic of this last part of Nebuchadnezzar's image. And today the world is more and more on a collision course with a stone. And that stone represents the kingdom that Christ is going to set up and it will smash that image to smithereens but that's the course on which we are 
Let's look up, shall we, Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. We, I'm sure we know the words, but to have them open in front of us. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So here we are then. We're at the time when he's going to bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, we know that that happened in 1967. You've heard Brother Stephen say today how that Judah refers to those in the land, and there is basis for that. And so here is the coming together again of Judah and Jerusalem. It's got to point to 1967 uh, in some way, hasn't it? But it's at that time, he says, he's going on to gather all the nations and bring them down. It's almost as though that bringing again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem had something to do with causing the nations to come and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat where they are going to be judged. And we will notice that even in this context, it calls the children of Israel my heritage, the heritage of Israel. And so, uh, as, we, as we see that happen, brethren and sisters, it isn't surprising when we look on the, uh, on the various websites, and we're doing our research on some of these things, that we see how the, uh, a graphic like this just happens to target exactly the mountains of Israel. The hostility against Israel has increased since 1967. Targeting the mountains of Israel more and more, they are becoming the, uh, the, the focus of controversy. And we look at the well-known words uh, of Isaiah 43. And we see that the reason for this hostility can be found in what Israel stands for. Brothers and sisters, take this passage and really chew it over and think about it. It's a passage we know well, but just think about it. Isaiah 43, verses 9 to 12. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, well, it's the truth. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Israel is a witness, a living witness, to the truth of the Bible. And you know that, brothers and sisters, because there are the prophecies telling us way ahead of time, A, that they would be preserved, God would never let them uh, completely disappear, and B, that they would be brought back again to their own land in these latter days, so they are a living witness to the truth of the Bible. And the humanistic world in which we live just does not care for that. They don't like it. Neither does the Roman Catholic Church either, if it comes to that. Today, we see Israel back in the land. The Christadelphian doctrines that you can read in your statement of faith converge with our prophetic understanding. We see Jews having returned in unbelief. And this, wrote Brother Thomas, is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations when he restores them into the rest of the kingdom. But Christ can't use atheists and unbelieving Jews as a nucleus for his kingdom. Think about it. Can he? A spiritual change is to be expected. It is necessary in the development of God's purpose. Here we see them returned in unbelief to serve as a nucleus or basis for future operations. And the scriptures give us a clear 
pattern, brothers and sisters, of what is to happen. Here are some of the passages. Brother Stephen already referred to one of them. Hosea chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Look it up if you're not familiar with it. But, you know, it's that passage that says that the children of Israel would abide many days without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an ephod, and so on. How that in the latter days they would return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And it goes on to say how that they would fear him in the latter days. So, if you look at that, you see a very clear... Um, well, maybe I should turn it up and let's just get the, uh, the, the thing out. Although Stephen did refer to it once already. Uh, there it is, look. Afterwards, after abiding many days without uh, an ephod and without a sacrifice and without a king and so on in verse 4. In verse 5 it says, Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and first seek the Lord their God and David their king. And then shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So they've got to return, they've got to seek, and then they will fear. Can you see that three points that, as you go down there? And then there are other passages also, of course, that talk about them coming back to the land. And then having come back to the land, how that they will be instructed uh, in, the, in, in the things uh, in spiritual things. Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 13 and 14. I will bring them out of the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel. We've got to notice that that geographic location is specifically pointed out. They are to be fed upon the mountains of Israel. Ignore it if you want. But there it is, by the rivers and all the inhabited places. Verse 14, I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. Well, like I already said, the mountains of Israel are the West Bank. No escaping that, brothers and sisters. And here they are to be brought to the, from the countries and they're put back there and they're going to be fed in that location. Whatever we want to make of it. Jeremiah chapter 3 was another one. It's already been referred to. And Jeremiah chapter 23 is, a, is, a, is another such passage that, um, that uh, impinges upon this particular matter Jer Jeremiah 23 you can't spend too long in looking that all up in detail because it takes time but uh, here it is Jeremiah 23 verse 3 and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries whether they have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be multiplied and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall uh, neither shall they fear any more nor be dismayed and, and so on and so forth so so the pattern is time after time Time after time, bring them back to the land, put them on the mountains of Israel, feed them. And he's not talking about cornflakes for breakfast either. He's talking spiritual food. And we've got to see that that pattern is there, brothers and sisters. And so what are we seeing on the mountains of Israel today then? We are seeing the development of a Bible-based culture and I want you to understand what I mean when I say that what's happening on the mountains of Israel today is that Jews are studying their Bibles incredibly so and I'm not talking about all Jews in Israel I'm talking about a very small number of them well a couple of hundred thousand anyway uh, which is on the mountains of Israel and they are studying their Bibles that's got to mean something. And that culture is forming a Bible-based culture. And I, I always draw the parallel with the Reformation. You see, when the Reformation happened in this country, going back to the 1500s and so on, what happened? Well, first of all, there was a, a turning away from all the traditions and all the, uh, the Roman Catholic mumbo-jumbo stuff. You know, well, the Jews have their parallel to that, you see. And there's a turning away from that amongst the Jews today. 
And gradually, uh, there was an opening up of the scriptures and people started to learn psalms off by heart and so on and so forth. Uh, that's what happened at that particular time. Read William Tyndale's books and you, you see how that, that, that went ahead at that particular time. And so there was a Bible knowledge. It doesn't mean to say they had the truth. Don't misunderstand me. It's not saying that. What it's saying is they had a Bible knowledge. So that when you spoke, or when our early brethren and sisters in the 1800s would have a lecture on the truth, on the, uh, preaching the truth, the gospel, at least they were talking to a people who knew their Bible, right? Well, that's the sort of situation. It was quite some time after the Reformation, of course, before Brother Thomas came along and discovered the whole truth uh, as it had originally been delivered by the apostles. And so we must expect a, de a development, like uh, Brother Stephen said. You know, it's not going to be a sudden conversion overnight. We're looking for a development. And we are seeing it, brothers and sisters. Now, just a few months ago... Sally and I uh, went into the West Bank, a place where not many tourists uh, choose to go. But we went into the West Bank and we went into a little place called Beit El. Those of you who read the Bible magazine will have probably uh, read about that. And um, we went into a school there, a special school that, um, that uh, the children go to. And we were astounded, brethren and sisters, to find young children of seven and eight years old who could recite off by heart the entire book of Leviticus. Well, you've just been doing your readings over the last little while. We've not long finished the book of Leviticus. Can you imagine learning that off by heart? Well, what I want to do now is just take you into that schoolroom so that you can see for yourself those children as they uh, do this. <laughs> I should have said before I put the clip on, it doesn't matter, you, you'll see, but uh, that man, the, the, the teacher, he comes out to us, and he's got a Bible, in Hebrew, of course, and he says, uh, he says, choose anywhere you like in the book of Leviticus, any, any page you want, whichever page you like. Well, I can't read Hebrew too well at all, in fact, I can't read it at all. So, uh, but I happen to have with us my son, Dave, who is fairly proficient in, 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 in his Hebrew studies, and uh, so I said, Dave, you, you choose somewhere. So uh, he did, he, he chose a spot. And from the exact spot where you choose, they can just take off, like that, reading and quoting the book of Leviticus. Now these are seven and eight year old kids. What happens when they get to be 17 and 18 and 19? They are kids with a Bible-based education right well that was that so we went to have a few words with the principal who's responsible for running this little school uh, that's the name of the school there <coughs> and uh, what I what we're saying is 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 this is this the beginning of a small nucleus that God might be able to work with well, we went and spoke to this uh, headmaster, principal, whatever you like to call him, uh, in the school. 
Israel, it's very, very kind of you to speak with us today. And I want you to tell us about the, uh, the operation that you've got going on here. We would call it a school. And, uh, but this is a very, very special school here on the mountains of Israel. Can you just fill us in and tell us what, uh, what it is you're doing here and the focus and so on? Yeah. Well, our school is... Uh, maybe the name of the school is going to give the answer what we're doing here. The name of the school is Shah Shamayim, the gate of the sky, like the word on and the Kibeta Elohim with the Shah Shamayim. We're learning Betel. And in Betel, the Bible says it's the gate of the sky. And uh, when you sit on the, on the gate of the, in the gate of the sky, you have to uh, know that you have a lot of responsible about it. The kids here learn all day, all year, every day, by the holy day, in the winter, in the summer, when everybody is in vacation, we sit and learn here. And learn the Bible. We start the Bible, then we learn the Mishnah, it's the beginning of the Talmud. And the kids learn this till they're going to know it by art. This is what we are need to do because this is what we call to do from the Torah and from our, our rabbi, Chazal. And this is what we do. And Bo Hashem, you saw the kids, you saw the classes, the kids learn. And they're happy about this learning because when you're doing something is right, you're doing something that you're supposed to do because this is what your job in the world, and you do it, you love, you're happy. You feel you do the right thing, and when you do the right thing, you're happy. So what you're meaning to tell me is that these little children here could recite off by heart the book, the whole of the book of Leviticus. Yeah. Uh, yes, this is what they do. Uh, and they learn about the past, and because they understand the past connects to the future. And uh, and if you want to grow to be a good man and to do what God expects from you, you have to learn from from the Tanakh what to do. And this is what they do here. The Tanakh is yes. what we call the Old Testament. Yes. So the, um, the responsible of every parent is to teach his son the Torah. Vishimanto Levanecha Vedibar Taban. Teach you kids, and the kids are going to know where to talk about it. And this is what you do. You talk around the table, you talk when you're walking, yes. you talk all, all, yes. all your life, even you not talk, but all your life, all your examples of the life, all your thoughts, even you don't sit right now, it's from the Torah, but if you, all your life is from the Torah, you are, um, we call the kid Sefer Torah. You are the book of the Bible. If you know everything by heart, you are the book of the Bible. So when these children grow bigger, they would be able to recite off by heart the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They know all off by heart. The first five books they're going to know by heart. The other books they're going to know, but they're going to have to repeat again and again to get it by heart because it's a lot of stuff. Oh, absolutely. But the idea is that you're going to start at, at, in one place, you're going to start putting something, they're going to know what you talk about it, and even part of it by heart everything. It depends how much you're smart. If you have good memory, you're going to remember everything. If you don't have good memory, you won't remember everything. But this is the idea. This is just absolutely incredible to our mind that people could learn this. Uh, I, I, All you can say is it's flabbergasted. I mean, like, you know, we have a Sunday school and we have a little what we call uh, memory verse or proof or something like that. And, you know, you, you're whipping the kids to sort of come back next Sunday and, and know their, their proof first. I mean, look at that. Here is being formed a Bible-based culture. I'm not saying they know the truth. But can you see that there's a preparatory work going on? There's a preparation being made, brothers and sisters. 
And these kids, as some of you, if you've seen some of our videos and that, you might know, uh, every month these teenagers, when they grow to be teenagers, uh, and many of the older ones too, they meet in Jerusalem and march around the gates of the Temple Mount, and they sing and pray for the redemption, so there is an element of understanding, for the coming of the Moshiach, and for the building of the Mishkan, for the temple. And the enthusiasm of these young people, uh, it can only be described as phenomenal. And as you watch them sing and dance with such enthusiasm as they go around the various gates, and they're doing this every month, brothers and sisters, it is incredible to be there with them and to go around and watch it. <laughs> Thousands of them. Their choice of music might not be yours. It certainly isn't mine. I like a bit of Mendelssohn myself. John doesn't like Mendelssohn, but I like Mendelssohn. And a bit of Handel. But it's the enthusiasm, do you see? As they're really dancing around the, those walls. And this is what they are singing. Let me read the words to you. I had them specially translated. Build it soon in our days, even the building of the Olam, and the throne of David your servant, may it be speedily in the midst, and Jerusalem your city, with mercy return and dwell in the midst, according as you have spoken. That's what's going on in the land today, brothers and sisters. And it strikes at the very heart of all that we hope for. And the time is coming when we can join with them. And that one body that we read of in Ephesians will be joined together. And the reigning seed, the royal seed, will rule over those people and in God's mercy be able to shepherd them, to bring them to a full understanding of truth when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. There is an element of belief, faith, not complete, but it's this that the world hates. The world is filled with hatred for it, brothers and sisters. The things that you and I love, the world hates. And it hates the hope of Israel because this testimony condemns an unbelieving world. See that from the passage we quoted from Isaiah. You are my witnesses. And there are the witnesses. And the world does not like it. And the Roman Catholic Church certainly doesn't like it either. You know, ever since 1948, when they printed this in the Servitore Romano, Modern Zionism is not the true heir of biblical Israel, but a secular state. Therefore, the Holy Land and its sacred sites belong to Christianity, the true Israel. There's your replacement theology for you. There is, there is your supersessionism. 
And so they would seek to disconnect Israel from the Bible. What a ridiculous thing. How could you disconnect the Jews from the Bible? But that's what they do, in essence. They teach the doctrine of substitution and replacement theology, and they believe that the church has replaced Israel. And it goes wider than just the... Uh, sorry, I should have had that screen up, but I read it anyway. <laughs> um, it goes wider than just the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. This is uh, a... a um, uh, a book that's more wider in its treatment, Christian Attitudes Toward the State of Israel. What is clear is that the Christian anti-Zionists are becoming more brutal in their indictment against Israel and Israel's friends every day. It goes on to say how that uh, they're being told that they should begin to prepare themselves for the thought that Israel will be thrown out of the land she presently imagines that she possesses. So this is Christians talking about the dismantling of the state of Israel. And Brother Thomas remarkably saw it all, didn't he? In uh, What time am I supposed to finish? <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm going to be quick, right. Putin meets the Pope just the other week, right? Brother Thomas, exposition of Daniel again, Anatolia, the autocrat of all the Russias as the head of a confederacy of the adherents of the Greek and Latin churches, it will be his policy to cause their priesthoods to be respected as useful cooperators in the subjection of Europe to his will. And here it is going on, brothers and sisters. This is what? A couple of weeks old? You know? Going on again, Brother, Ro Brother Thomas, the Tsar, or the leader of Russia, will not be hostile to the Pope. On the contrary, he will acknowledge, honor and acknowledge him, and be the enemy of the Holy Land. Be the enemy of the Holy Land. Do you see the controversy of Zion coming to a head through false Christianity on the one side and through this, this um, humanistic uh, thing on the other. Russian president, this is what the news said the other day, Russian president Vladimir Putin met today with Pope Benedict XVI for the first time acting as a mediator between the leader of the world's Roman Catholics and the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Can you imagine that? The leader of Russia acting as a mediator between the heads of the two churches, East and West, bringing them together, fulfills exactly what Brother Thomas expected. The BBC, Putin wants the Pope on his side as he restores Russia as a global force. And so we see the energy, control of energy that Russia now has. You're familiar with this. 2006, it was the gas 2007, it was the oil, and you see them getting a grip on the control of Europe's energy. And I just hope, brothers and sisters, that Great Britain wakes up pretty quick to get and cut itself off from this, from this system that is arising, because it is terrible. But we must close. John's given me the nod. So uh, just look at that title of... Brother Thomas's book, and just go through it step by step. This is the inside page. I've, re I've retyped it out to make it easy for you to read. But look what he got it there. Anatolia, or Russia triumphant and Europe chained. He didn't say chained with gas pipes and oil pipes, but he might as well have done. Uh, being an exposition of prophecy showing the inevitable fall of the French and Ottoman empires. Where are they now? The occupation of Egypt and the Holy Land, which happened. The formation of a Russian Latino-Greek confederacy. We see that coming about today. Its invasion and conquest of Egypt, Palestine, and Jerusalem. Its destruction in the West Bank. Oh, but he says the mountains of Israel. The long-expected deliverance of the Jews by the Messiah his subjugation of the world through their agency and consequent establishment of the kingdom of Israel. In these things, 
we see the exciting evidence, brothers and sisters, as to why the faith of early Christadelphians remains valid for this generation. Let's do all that we can to spread it amongst ourselves and amongst our young people and let them realize that the things that we have believed are true and sure. This is where doctrine and prophecy converge. For the time has come to remember the covenant with Israel. Thank you very much.